Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 199 to begin our time of worship. Christ receiveth sinful men. Sinners Jesus will receive Sound this word of grace to all Who the heavenly pathway leave All who linger, all who fall Sing it o'er and o'er again Christ receive a sinful man Make the man Christ receive a sinful man, come and he will give you rest, trust him for his word is plain, he will take the sinful last, Christ receive a sinful man, sing it o'er and o'er again, Christ receive receive a sinful man now my heart condemns me not pure before the law I stand he who cleansed me from all spot satisfied its last demand sing it o'er and o'er again Christ receive a sinful man make the message clear and plain Christ receive a sinful man Christ receive a sinful man even me with all my sin purge from every spot and stain heaven within I enter in, sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive a sinful man, make the message clear and plain. Christ receive a sinful man. Christ said, not the righteous, but sinners. He came to save. Let's take our Bibles and look in Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. And we'll read and comment through this entire chapter, Lord willing. Genesis chapter 8. And here we have where it says God remembers Noah. It's not that he forgot him. That's what they call an anthro, uh, anthropomorphism, which just means that it attributes to God what typically refers to men, but it's for our understanding. And so it says, God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. So here, certainly God never forgot Noah. He'd set his love upon him. He was an object of God's grace, one for whom he would send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay his sin debt. So he could never forget, in that sense, God never forgets any of his own. But it's a manner of speaking in which now God is turning his attention again toward Noah. And so in that sense, it says that he remembered Noah. And the purpose here is that God would now bring a wind to pass upon the earth that was covered with water. Noah had been actually shut up in the ark for approximately a year when you consider 
the time of the beginning of when he went in and the time when he was to come out. He was a year long in that ark. And God was executing his complete judgment on the earth. He determined the time that Noah should enter into that ark, just like any of us, that time is determined by God that we should enter into Christ and know him, and that our time of, of being in Christ, there is no end, but for as long as we're on this earth, only the Lord knows the end from the beginning. He knows the time of our entering. He knows the time of, of our departure, if you will, from this world. And so God made a wind to pass over the earth. This is the creative God that knew how to make the waters subside. This would have been too great a problem for man. We have these local floods that come through and it wipes out areas and people are just unbelievable when they see the power of that water and they don't know what to do with it. Well, such is not the case with God. Even as big a problem as this was, it was not a problem to God. Is there anything too hard for God? And so God, who had created the heavens and the earth and caused the water to remain in the firmament until it was time for him to cause it to drop. All of these things reveal the manifest power and authority of God over his creation. So in verses 2 to 5, it says, The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Who could do that but God? And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventh, seventeenth day of the month, even upon the mountains of Ararat. When it says the mountains of Ararat, this would have been in Turkey, in the northeastern part of Turkey. And uh, there are actually two mountains there even today. They call it the Greater Ararat and the Lesser Ararat. And the Greater Ararat actually stands about 16,854 feet tall. And you say, why on earth did God put him so, up, so far high up on that mountain? Well, he was going to prove himself that just as he kept him through the flood, so now he would cause him to come down and populate the earth. And so this is what we see here, that the waters decrease continually until the 10th month. And the 10th month on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen. So that shows you right there just how high the waters were that God brought upon the earth. He says, the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped. The rain that began, we read that back in Genesis 7, 11 and 12, now stopped. So God is directing in the pouring of the rain and the stopping of the rain. And the same is true today. You can talk about climate change or all these things, but it's the Lord who is determining all things, beginning and the end. And so on the mountains of Ararat, you can look at these pictures, and they're beautiful. They're snow-capped. And that's where the Lord caused the ark to settle. Some say that it might be preserved over the years as a testimony of God's salvation, that even over the years people could look up and see that ark there, particularly Noah and his family as they continued to populate the earth, and it was a reminder of God's deliverance of them. They have tours today there's these Sherpas that are skilled in climbing these mountains 
and they say they believe that they've still found the ruins of this ark, something that when they x-ray from above, they can actually see it down in the snow, but no one's been able to excavate or get it out. And I believe that's important too because men will make an idol out of anything. In fact, they already do. You can go up to Kentucky and see a replica, supposedly, of the measurement of this ark, and people go, and they got zip line and kids' programs and all this stuff going on, have no clue as to how that ark was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here the Lord purposed that it be placed there, high out of reach of man, and in the mountaintop, which is a reminder, too, of salvation being of the Lord. These high mountains represent his majesty, and that's where he caused the ark to rest. Then, verses 6 through 12, the waters, and it came to pass at the end of the of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. And the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days. And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening. And lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf. So many of these pictures you see drawn of the dove carrying a branch. A, branch, a dove is not strong enough to carry a branch. But there's a leaf here that the dove brought in, plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth a dove, which returned not again unto him any more. You say, why all this detail about these birds? Well, there's significance in every scripture. Here it was at the end of 40 days. Remember, 40 is a type of judgment throughout the scriptures. Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. Christ, 40 days in temptation. But there was an end to what God had determined. And this would have been counted from the time when the rain and other water sources began back in Genesis 7, verses 11 and 12. God had told Noah when to enter the ark, but he didn't tell him when he should come again. This required Noah waiting on the Lord. And that's certainly the case for us. We don't know one nanosecond from now what God has determined, but we wait and we look to him for that time in which he would have us move forward. But here we see Noah opening the window of the ark, which he had made. Remember back in Genesis 6 and verse 16, when Noah had made the ark, God commanded that the upper portion of the ark be a window. The window was also made of some kind of covering that could be closed and opened. Otherwise, when it was raining, it would have rained inside. So even there, the Lord purposed there be a window, and yet that it protect Noah and his family. And so Noah here is to believe God. When you go over to Hebrews chapter 11, he acted according to that faith that God gave him. And some liken this window, which would have been heavenward, and that's all that Noah could have seen. Whatever that window was opened, all he could see was the sky and the clouds and the heavens, and yet that's where he was caused to look and to wait. And that's why then he sent out a raven, because this ark was not being driven by Noah. This was God's ark, just like salvation. No part of it is up to man to determine its direction. And so the ark was settled, Noah was in it, 
There was a window out of which he looked, but we find him waiting here upon God. Now, when he sent out the raven, it says he kept going to and fro. Don't think that that meant going out and coming back to the ark. The, the way it's written here is that once the raven left the ark, he did not return. He kept going to and fro. You say, well, what was the raven doing? Well, he's a scavenger bird. And so he would have been feeding on dead carcasses, likely floating carcasses at this time, and therefore content going to and fro eating dead carcasses. I believe that's a type of false religion. That's people that live off of dead works. And as soon as they can be free of anything pertaining to Christ and salvation, they're gone. They'll spend the rest of their life going to and fro from one dead religion to another, dead works to another, but never desirous of ever returning to what would have been the only salvation, and that was the ark. Then the dove, see that's the comparison here. The dove, I believe, represents those that are Christ's. And here it says the dove found no resting place. She returned into the ark. In other words, when the dove went out, the dove by nature could not feed on dead works could not feed on carcasses, nor can any who are the Lord's feed on dead works. Being a non-scavenging bird, the dove would not land upon the earth until there was a dry, suitable place to land. So that's why the dove kept coming back to the ark. And it's a picture, I believe, of God's children that can't settle. They won't settle unless they find their rest in Christ and uh, that their feet land on solid ground or in trees where they're going to be safe and, and make their, their nests. So this is the point, I believe, as, as we look at this, of the dove finding no resting place. Does that describe you? Does that describe me? No resting place in the dead works of this world? This world is not improving, it's not progressing, it's not advancing, it's not getting better. And so those of us that live in this world continue to go back and forth, if you will, to Christ and the ark and, and find no resting place in this world, no, no place for us to settle. This world is not our home, it's, we're just a passing through. But the dove came back to Noah with a fresh, freshly plucked olive leaf in her mouth. The raven never returned. But the dove came back with evidence that that terrible season of judgment through the flood was now over. And the olive leaf was an indication that God had begun to renew plant life on the earth. And that's where life is. It's in God and the dove with an olive leaf has since then been a symbol of what peace and goodness in the world but we know there's no peace or goodness apart from Christ but once the Lord had directed that this dove find a place where it could rest and make its home, it no longer returned to Noah. And so that indicated to Noah that the earth was now habitable again. You can imagine the devastation, the uprooting, and what it was for Noah to continue to wait upon God to be reestablished himself. It says here in verse 13 of Genesis 8, down to verse 19, it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, 
I love this. And behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. The whole earth world would be repopulated from this point. And Noah went forth, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. What a beautiful picture. It says in the 601st year. Now in Genesis 7 and verses 11 to 13, we saw that Noah entered the ark on the 17th day of the second month of the 600th year of his life. So this would have been almost a full year later because here's the second month of his 601st year that Noah left the ark. And so it seems that the ark, he was in there a full calendar year by God's determining. And certainly our boundaries are determined by God. That's what it says over in Acts 17, where we live and inhabit and dwell. It's according to God's direction. But he says to him to bring out every living thing, just as the ark was loaded with animals before the flood, it was then unloaded. And this is an amazing thing. We don't read that any animals died that year in the ark. Such was the preservation of God. But he preserved them because the world is the Lord's. The animal kingdom, the kingdoms of this world are his. And where he determines they live, and it's an amazing thing when you consider because there were some predator animals that were preserved in that ark, but not one of them attacked another. And the Lord did it that they might be fruitful and multiply to repopulate the earth. And when it says Noah came out of the ark, no longer cooped up or penned up with its narrow limits, again, he never, we don't read he ever complained. He waited on the Lord, not knowing how long he would be there, but I believe it's a picture of the freedom that once justice has been satisfied, which it was in the death of, of all those, the, the judgment falling on the world and actually falling on Noah and his family and the animals, but they were covered, and so they did not die. So it's, it's a picture of the death of Christ and being buried with him and then the rejoicing of coming out, coming forth in freedom, that freedom that those that God has saved by Christ enjoy, never more to be condemned. But in verse 20 then, we see where Noah, what's the first thing he did? Builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast you say, why were there clean beasts that were brought onto the ark? For this reason, he took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings. That means they were totally burnt up before the Lord upon the altar. No part of it was to be preserved for Noah and his family as meat. They were to take that and to offer it before the Lord. So Noah's first act after leaving the ark was to worship God through sacrifice. I wonder how he learned that goes all the way back to the fall where God took those animals and slew them and clothed Adam and Eve. And Abel learned without shedding of blood there's no remission of sin. Noah didn't take the ark for granted and say well that's all that's necessary. No. There's always been the necessity of sacrifice and that's what we look for wherever through scripture we see a picture of salvation look for sacrifice. And here he did it in gratitude and admiration of God's greatness 
That's what led him to worship. But he took of every clean animal and every clean bird. That's what the sacrifice had to be, representing Christ without sin. And that's what these represented. You remember there were actually only seven of each animal on the ark of the clean ones that were brought in. And so you might think, well, Noah risked in offering these animals their extinction, but he didn't. It was according to his God purposed. He offered up exactly the number that God determined, and the rest were kept for continuing to reproduce, that there always might be clean animals that should be sacrificed unto the Lord. And yet that's what God required. And it's a type and picture of Christ who was without sin. Found no sin in him. Sin was laid on him, but there was no sin in him. And uh, that's the only sacrifice that God could ever accept. So in verses 21 and 22, here's where we see God now making this promise to Noah and really to the world. In verses 21 and 22, so the Lord smelled a sweet savor. Imagine burnt flesh. We saw that already in Leviticus. When it was burnt up completely, it would it was stunk. This wasn't when people say, well, how do you like your steak? Well, this was completely burnt. And yet, before the Lord, it was a sweet savor because of what? It represented Christ. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. What he means is by water. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter, the day and night shall not cease. We read later that God has purposed to destroy this earth and man's works with fire, but never again would it be on this scale. We have different local floods that come the Lord sends it's a reminder that man is frail and mortal and yet God promises to never again visit the earth with this type of judgment on this scale to destroy every living thing and in that we see his sovereignty that as history unfolds it's of God even though it says there doesn't it Man, it doesn't change man. Some people think, well, if God's kind to sinners, then they'll turn to him. No, here it says for the, the, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. That means every sinner that would be born from these descendants of Noah would be born sinners. None of them pure. But that God would be merciful and not curse them because of their sin, but in all of this there was that sacrifice that he had promised in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, without which there could be no salvation. Without sacrifice, sin demands God's vengeance. And if he doesn't destroy all of mankind, it's, that's his forbearance. But there is a day of judgment for everybody. You've either been judged in Christ when he came and paid the sin debt, or you will be judged for your sin and eternal separation from God. And that's why the importance of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God would preserve a seed all the way down to Christ from Noah, from Shem, and through David and on. But this was the beginning of that covenant for Christ's sake. And God promises here that after the flood, the earth would have established seasons. There weren't seasons before the flood, if you think about it. There wasn't any rain. And I know people today talk about climate change and different things. No, God set everything in order right, right here from the flood. Isn't that what it says there? While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. What part of that don't you understand? You know, 
when it gets cold, that's not climate change. That's just the Lord saying it's going to be cold. When it gets hot, that's not climate change. That's the Lord determined it's going to be a season for heat. Seed time, harvest, who determines all these things? That's the Lord. So the result of this change also affected from here forward lifespans of men. There will not ever be 900-year-old men after the flood. Even that God determined. And you can try all you want to to extend that your life to a certain degree, but it's the Lord that determines it. But how faithfully God fulfills his covenant with the earth and how blessed are those that he preserves for Christ's sake. And he does preserve them because those for whom Christ paid the debt, they are saved in that forever. Thank you, Father, for your word. So much here to consider. But may we bow in utter admiration for who you are, how you direct all things that you would be merciful to sinners such as we are for Christ's sake. We certainly don't deserve that mercy, but if you purposed it in your grace, then it's because you've determined that we should be saved through your son. I thank you for the pictures of salvation here with Noah and his family, with the ark, and that all things are exactly as they should be according to your will. Give us rest in that, even in the upheavals and turmoils of life. This world is a fallen world, and yet you are the one sustaining it, and uh, you are the one keeping your people in it. Even as Christ prayed, he prayed not that you take us from the world, but that you keep us from evil. So I'm thankful that you're the great creator, sustainer, and Redeemer of your people. We give you praise in Christ's precious name. Amen. 485, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now. shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Alleluia, thine the glory. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne sins and has cleansed every stain. Alleluia, thine the glory. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. Made soul Let's take our Bibles and turn to John chapter 14 and verse 6 to begin with. And going through the L's on the titles of Christ, we come to life. Christ the life. When we say Christ, we say life. Now it's interesting when you try to define life without using the word life. What is life? You say, well, it's existence. 
nothing would be unless it was brought into existence. But it's much more than that. Some say, well, it's a state of vitality. If it's moving, then uh, it has life. And certainly there are synonyms for the word life that refer to the spirit, to breath, the very breath of God. It says that God in creation breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became what? A living being, which means before that he was just dust. So that's what we're going to look at here. How is Christ the life? Seems like a simple subject, doesn't it? But very profound when we get into studying it further. Here in John chapter 14 is a good summary of what the Lord told his disciples. He was preparing them for going to the cross. And that's really what he's talking about here in verse 1 of chapter 14 when he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Why would they have been troubled? Well, he had just told Peter that before the cock crew that Peter would deny him three times. So that was troubling. And yet he says, ye believe in God, believe also in me. What's he stating? That to believe in God is to believe in Christ. And those who don't believe in Christ don't believe in God. Doesn't matter what name they give to him. If it's not Christ, it's not God. If, if it is God, then it's Christ his beloved son. And when he says there in verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions, that's an old English word actually that had to do with dwelling places. But you notice, in my father's house. He's describing there a spiritual house with many dwelling places, rooms. Plenty of room, but no vacancy, just like on the ark. And he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. Here's Christ in the flesh. God in the flesh, as they looked upon him and listened to him, they're actually looking at a man and needing to be reminded that he is God in the flesh speaking with him. That's the only way that God could ever address a sinner. I believe that was the case when Moses was up on the mountain for those 40 days and he spoke with God as a, as a friend with a friend. He was speaking with Christ because there was no way, even as... Later, God told him when he asked to see his glory, he said, no man can see my face and live. He put him in the cleft of the rock. Another picture of Christ. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you. He's not talking about going up into heaven and preparing all these dwellings and places. Notice I go to prepare a place for you. Well, where was he going? He was going to the cross. And that's where salvation was to be worked out. That's where life was to flow forth for that people that the Father had given to his Son. There's a person and there's a place. The person is Christ. The place is Calvary. That's where God put his Son to death that he might be just to justify. But he says, if I go, or since I am going, might be another way to read that, and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. What's he talking about coming again and receiving them? He's talking about his resurrection. That such would be the satisfaction of God the Father in his death that he could not remain in the grave. It would be impossible for his soul to see corruption. That's the way it's written there in the Old Testament. But he'd come again and what? Receive you unto myself. That was the only way that Sinners could ever be received, even as we began our time of worship. Christ receiveth, what, sinful men. And make the message clear and plain. So if we've been received, it's by Christ unto God the Father, because he's made us accepted in that beloved one, but it's because there's been a sacrifice that has been made, and God has been satisfied, and by the resurrection of Christ, we know that everyone for whom Christ died, they are justified. He was delivered up, Paul says there in Romans, for our offenses 
and was raised again for or because of our justification. So anybody that tries to put justification anywhere else but at the cross, they've missed it. But he says, whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. He's been talking to them about his death and how he would go to Jerusalem and be delivered up into the hands of the religious leaders of that day, but they still were hard of hearing. <clears throat> so Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? And that's where we see this clear declarative statement of Christ. I don't know of any that's more clear in all of Scripture as to who he is. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The truth, and there it is, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then he says, if you had known me, which means they still needed to learn of him and who he is. See, this takes completely off the table that question that so many people struggle with. And I was talking to somebody this week about that. How much do you need to know to be saved? How many times has that been brought up? It's not on our knowledge. It's on Christ having known those that the Father had given him. And by his knowledge, as the way it's written there in Isaiah 53, shall my righteous servant, what? Justify many by his knowledge. I can rest in that. So even here, <clears throat> yes, the Lord is chastising them, but he's not turning his back on him when he says, if you had known me, ye should have known my father also. But he says, and from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. Bringing them back to who he is. Oh, how we need to be brought back to who he is. Because I'll tell you, this old heart will deceive us every time. We begin to look inwardly. We begin to question by our experiences whether we're the Lord's or not. That's quicksand if you ever get caught in that trap. Now, we're to look to Christ and rest in his work and what he's accomplished. And so Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? The reason I've read that entire context is because when it speaks of Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, we're seeing him as God himself, God in the flesh. That's who he is. He's the source of eternal life. Without him, there is no eternal life. And Christ said there in John 10, 28, that He's the one that gives eternal life, that sinners should not perish. He's the bread of life. He's the, the water of life. He told Martha in John 11, he's the resurrection and the life. So any one of those we could go to and spend the entire time looking at, but the Lord has directed me to focus here on John 14, 6. Christ, the way, the truth, and the life here he identifies himself as the only way to the father emphasizing that true life is found in him alone and that's what it takes it took christ giving his life that those for whom he died might have life and that by his spirit life is given to be brought to christ and to know him You'll notice here that this declaration of Christ features three different affirmations unlike any others that you might find elsewhere in Scripture. And these are what are called the I am statements. When Christ said I am, he's identifying himself with God as God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So don't just read lightly over the I am's here where Christ said, I am the way. Well, 
He's identifying himself as God. I am the truth. I am. And I am the life. Notice definite articles. So the truth here that Jesus is the way to God is saying that he is God. And that echoes the same I am statements that you find in John 10 where he says, I am the door and I am the shepherd of the sheep who gives his life for the sheep. There is only one God. People can say all they want to about, well, you know, each person has their view of who God is, and so it really doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. There's only one God, that's what Paul wrote to Timothy, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And he only has one kingdom. And salvation is not like a mountain like some describe where different people are climbing up different sides of the mountain. But in the end, if they can reach the pinnacle, then they'll find God. No. Nope. There is only one mountain, but it's Jesus Christ. And he alone is the one that can grant life when it says that life is in him and his son. He alone grants that life. Apart from him, none will have eternal life. They might have physical life, but not eternal. And only those for whom Christ died will enjoy that life through his death. This is why it's such a fallacy for preachers to say, well, Christ died for everybody, and now it's up to each individual to appropriate his death to themselves. When was the last time you saw a dead man appropriating anything to himself? Imagine going into the morgue and standing over a cadaver and saying, okay, now, if you really want life, you've got to appropriate it. We're here to help you, but you've got to do your part. How foolish. But somehow people continue to want to believe that in man, though dead, there's still some flame that if that sinner will just exercise his will, and the question is, what will? He's dead. That's how he's born in this world. And the only ones that God ever grants life to is for those that he gave to his son. And therein is our assurance that everyone that Christ died to pay their debt, that life is given through his blood, through his death. And it's by him then that they enter into God's presence. I know this message is very controversial and offensive because it strikes against the very ego of man. Because man wants to think that somehow God has done all he can do, but now the rest is up to you. If you ever hear a preacher say that, stand up and yell, liar, and run. Because that man does not know God. If God were to do all that he could do and lay you at the door of salvation and all you had to do was reach up and turn the door handle, you couldn't. There would be no salvation because you're dead. You take a dead body, you move it from here and put it over there, it's dead. It takes the very spirit of God. But that's an offense to man because man likes to think that somehow, and that goes all the way back to the fall when Satan tempted Adam and Eve and made them think that somehow if they ate of that tree of the light, of the knowledge of good and evil that they would be as God. Well, they understood once they partook of the difference between good and evil, but they were brought to see that what they thought would be good was actually evil. And the only good that can come from it is if God's pleased in his grace to grant life to such sinners. But this is not saying here that Christ is one of the ways to God. He says here, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. He's the truth. He's the life. 
No, for lost sheep. And that's who Scripture describes those that Christ came to save. He is the way. He's not standing there calling the sheep to hopefully find their way back. No, he is the way. He goes to where they are and puts them on his shoulder and brings them into the fold. If you're the Lord's, that's how he brought you. For lost sheep, sheep are dumb. They're in darkness and ignorance. That's how we're born in this world. But he's the truth. And when he's pleased to reveal himself in your heart, you'll know him as the truth. That's what Christ said. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's no greater freedom for those who at one time had been in darkness and ignorance. Now to have their eyes open to see Christ and have life in him, because that's what it takes. It takes life to see. And for any sheep that are spiritually dead, they're dead, that means unable to come. So it takes Christ who is the life. It takes his resurrection life to draw each one of those sheep. Now in light of the soon events here that Christ was facing, because from here forward, John 13, all the way to the end of John, he's preparing them for his death. These are the messages that he left with his disciples. This would, this declaration then would seem to be a paradox because the Jews, though they were looking for a Messiah, they weren't looking for one to be crucified. And so that's the paradox here. When Christ says, I am the way, he's saying the way is the way of the cross. That he would literally be convicted by blatant liars and that his own body would soon lie lifeless in a tomb. And you can see how unless God grants eyes to see, you look at that and think, this man was an imposter. That's the way they would have thought about him. If he really was life, how could you put him to death? Well, God didn't die on the cross. The man did. He was the sacrifice. That's why a body was prepared for him. But it was necessary that he die in order that upon satisfaction of God's law and justice by his death that he should live, rise again. And that that death would be the death of everyone the Father gave him, and his life would be their life. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, what? I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God. Not your faith in the Son of God, but the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So that seems like a paradox to people of the world because they think, well, he died, he rose again, now it's up to us to appropriate his work. No, from beginning to end, Christ is the originator of the life, he's the author of it, he's the giver of it, he's the sustainer of it. Life is in him. And because he took that way to the cross, that's how he had to work this out all the way to the cross. It wouldn't have been enough for him to live a perfect life and then ascend into heaven and then say to his followers, now do the best you can. Can you imagine? That would leave them in no better state. In fact, a worse state than had he not come at all because they would have had some hope and then now to realize that in the end it was up to them anyway. He's the life. He's the way to God. He didn't contest with the lies of those who crucified him. He submitted himself unto death according to the will of his father, knowing that through his death life would be granted. But without this way, that's what he's talking about here in John 14, 6, as the way, without that way of going to the cross, there would be no going to God. And without the truth, there would be no knowing, someone said, 
Without the way, no going. Without the truth, no knowing. And without the life, there would be no living. It all comes back to who Christ is, where he said, I am the way. And he's the one that, he doesn't just show the way, he is the way. He says, I am the truth. He's not just showing us the truth. He's the revealer of the truth as who he is. And without him giving life, there wouldn't be any hope. That's why he says here, except that no one comes to the Father except through me. Not just Christ making the way possible. I hear people interpreting it that way. See, Christ has made the way possible for you. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. But now you must follow. Well, if that were the case, then none would come. When he made this remarkable statement here, claiming that he was the only way to God, he was declaring that he is the exclusive way. That's the word, a word that people today don't like to hear. They don't like to hear Christ alone. Sorry to talk about Christ, but let me add my will to it. Let me add my endeavors to it. Let me add my determination. Nope. He's the exclusive way. He's the exclusive truth and the exclusive life to such a point where back here in John chapter 5 and verse 44, he said, how can ye believe? He said that to the Pharisees, which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. How can you believe? But then, then over in John 6 and verse 44, he declared again, no man can come to me except the Father has sent, which has sent him, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. How can he say that except for life is in him? And again, he says there in verse 65, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me. What does it take to come? It takes life. Dead bodies don't come of their own. No, it takes life. And except it were given unto him of my father. That pretty much settles the matter, doesn't it? If any that do come, it's the father that gave them to the son. And you talk about it being controversial. Even in Christ's day, it says in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back. It's not those that were true disciples, but fest disciples went back and walked no more with him and that's when jesus said unto the 12 will ye also go away and peter answered lord to whom will we go here it is thou hast the words of eternal life thou hast them that means they're in you to whom shall we go so nobody can come unto god except not just that christ gives them that opportunity or that option, but he authorizes. You've seen those doors and businesses, authorized personnel only. If you're not authorized personnel, you're not going in there. And so understood plainly, even though this is one of the more controversial things that Christ has ever said and the gospel writer wrote, yet it is the only way. And it is consistent with everything we know about God that apart from his son coming, living, dying, rising again, and sending on high, there is no salvation. And apart from his spirit giving life to reveal Christ in the heart and soul of those that he died to save, they're, they won't come. That's why people continue to follow their religion. <clears throat> They're happy with it because they love dead works, just like that raven that went out to and fro, feeding off of carcasses and cadavers. That's all people are doing. They might land somewhere where they mention the name of Christ or even open this Bible and read it, but when you hear how they define Christ, really, Christ is set forth as somebody who came to show the way. He's not the way. He shows the way. Now you have to follow. It's not what the Scriptures say. It's not a matter of personal opinion. 
I get people saying that all the time to me. Well, it's just a matter of personal opinion. That's your opinion. It's not opinion. What saith the Lord? And uh, the scriptures are clear. People call you bigoted. I've heard that so many times, <laughs> bigoted. Well, I'd rather be that sinner that lays at Christ's feet knowing that my only hope is in the life that he died to give me and by his spirit has given me. And thereby I stand accepted in him. What a glorious truth that we have here of Christ. The life. Apart from him, there is none. Hymn number 49. Our great Savior. How do you hear a message like that and not be able to sing this? Our great Savior. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Hallelujah, what a Savior I Miss, look forward to next time, Lord willing.